of 2015, everybody agrees. The crisis that has been created as a humanitarian crisis of refugees, as a crisis and challenge to the international asylum system, and as a crisis to mainstream politics and mainstream parties in the European Union, linked to the tragic humanitarian emergency in Syria, has become the central issue in European politics. In order to find ways to address this crisis, to turn it into an opportunity that strengthens the international asylum system and to prevent it eroding the core values of the European Union, we need clear thinking, setting aside illusions and focusing on clear and practical solutions. This has not yet happened. And so what I would like to do now is to outline how we best think about the opportunity and danger created by the inflow of mainly Syrian but also other refugees into the European Union in 2015. Let us first understand the nature of the crisis we are dealing with. Syria is today the country that is generating the largest number of refugees in the world. Turkey is today the country that hosts the largest number of refugees in the world. Lebanon is today the country with the largest number of refugees per capita, per population. So we are dealing with a very specific consequence of the four-year war that has been waged in Syria and that shows no sign of ending. We are also dealing with a crisis of the global response. If we look at asylum applications in 2014 around the world, we see that most of the rich countries in the world have found ways to isolate, insulate themselves from refugee movements. Last year the total number of asylum applications in the whole year in Australia was less than 9,000. In Japan it was 5,000. In South Korea it was 3,000. The rich countries in the world, the industrial countries, have found a way not to be touched and while they maintain their commitment to the Refugee Convention and the right to asylum, they have actually created a situation where very few refugees are in a position to even submit a claim. So the crisis that we see is that today, as a result of the movement of refugees into the European Union, three countries, Germany, Sweden and Austria, are likely to be receiving more than two-thirds of all asylum applications in the world. Now this has led to the third crisis, which is a crisis of mainstream political parties. In response to this humanitarian um, reaction, particularly by the Swedish and German government, that have said we will be and we will try to cope with this and we will keep respecting the principles of the Convention for Refugees, in response to this we've seen an unprecedented mobilization of populist political forces, some of them in government. We've seen the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban already two and a half months ago define the refugee crisis as an opportunity to end the era of liberal values. He said on the 5th of September in a meeting with his party group that uh, this is a huge opportunity to restore the prestige and appeal of national identity and Christian identity in opposition to liberal identity. And then he explained that liberal identity is Europe talking about universal human rights. We should stop, he said, because this attracts the poor of the world to rich Europe. And by liberals, Viktor Orban means mainstream politicians, like the Swedish government or the German government led by Angela Merkel. Today, Viktor Orban is no longer isolated. In the Czech Republic, President Zeman is attending uh, Islamophobic uh, meetings. The Prime Minister of Slovakia, Mr. Fico, has been talking about the need to put a policeman behind every Muslim in Slovakia. We've had very strong uh, signals linking Muslims, terrorism and refugees from Poland. In Sweden today, the Swedish Democrats, with its roots in far-right extremist politics, is now the most popular party in opinion polls. In the Netherlands, it is the party of Gerd Wilders. In Austria, the Freedom Party has scored over 30% of the votes in recent elections in Vienna. And Le Pen in France is poised for another electoral success later this year. So what we see emerging in response to the refugee crisis, fanning the fears and associating refugees with terrorism and disease and threats, is the emergence of a new populist coalition that is strong enough to, in the medium term, transform European politics. 
So what is to be done? The humanitarian emergency is not going to end anytime soon. The Syrian war is not going to end. There will still be refugees. At the same time, the situation in Germany, Sweden, Austria and other countries where refugees are arriving is reaching a breaking point where the Swedish government says it is already receiving 200,000 people this year. It needs to send its own electorate a signal that this process can be controlled. We need to combine respect for the convention with a political response that shows that mainstream parties can maintain control over Europe's external border. And we need a solution that works fast while preserving the humanitarian principle of protecting those who seek protection. How can this be done? Well, first of all, we need to be clear about a few basic principles of border management. You cannot, anywhere in the world, control a sea border without support of your neighbors. Let's again take the example of Australia. Australia has a policy that is extremely harsh. Indefinite detention for people who arrive uh, irregularly or illegally in Australia. A policy that nobody who reaches Australian waters can apply for asylum. But Australia can only implement this policy because it takes refugees and puts them in other states like Nauru or Papua New Guinea. These other states cooperate. The refugees are put in camps there and then cannot apply and cannot reach Australia. Europe cannot do this. First of all because there is no Nauru for Europe. The numbers are much too high to reach the Greek islands. There are no international waters between Greece and Turkey. And most importantly, this would violate every commitment that Europe has made in its own legislation, in the European Convention on Human Rights, and in its support for the Refugee Convention. Now, what then can be done? Some say uh, that any price is not too high to pay to control the borders. Anything must be done. Just be ruthless, send a strong signal. This is what Thailand has been trying to do in the last few years. In Thailand, on occasions, the military, which is in control of the border, has pushed back boats with Muslim refugees from Myanmar, pushed them back into the sea, and as human rights organizations and international media have reported, left them there to die. This too is obviously an unacceptable, a murderous, a criminal policy for the European Union. So if you need the support of your neighbors to control your sea borders, because any boat that reaches Greek waters is already in the European Union and has to be rescued or brought on land where people can apply for asylum, then Turkey becomes crucial to any control of movements in the Aegean. Now did the European Union, what did the European Union ask from Turkey to do? Really there are two things that Turkey needs to do and both are costly, politically difficult and unpopular. But both would have a major impact on movements of refugees. The first thing that Turkey needs to do is to offer Syrian refugees in Turkey a perspective of a future, to open the labor market, to invest massively in education for Syrian children, to offer the possibility for Syrians in Turkey to build a new life there. Now, for Turkey this is a huge challenge because it has such a large number of refugees. And it is understandable that the government has been hesitating, although it sees the need to move in this direction. The second thing that Turkey would need to do is to commit to take back refugees that reach the Greek, reach the Greek islands. Now, this can be done today. There is an agreement, a legally binding agreement between Greece and Turkey, a readmission agreement. But in order for Turkey and Greece to implement the readmission agreement, Turkey would first have to allow refugees to apply for asylum in Turkey, which under its current legislation, a new law in force since 2014 is possible, but has not yet been implemented. Let me explain how this would work. A Pakistani would arrive in Greece. The Pakistani would apply for asylum in Greece. Greece would say that Turkey is a safe third country for refugees, which means that refugees are safe in Turkey from persecution or danger. The asylum claim would be rejected as unfounded. And within two weeks, Greece would return the Pakistani to Turkey. The same would be done for a Syrian who arrives in Greece. 
But for Pakistanis and Syrians, there would then be a possibility to apply for asylum in Turkey. And in order for Turkey to take back people, member states of the European Union would need to offer to Turkey to resettle a large number of Syrian refugees, and we've recommended for Germany to offer to take 500,000 in a year, directly from Turkey to Germany. This scheme would on the one hand reduce the pressure on Syrians to leave Turkey. Those who would apply and would be accepted to be taken to European Union member states would not need to risk their lives and the lives of their families crossing the sea. Germany or other countries that would take part would know who they are accepting. These people would be registered, they would know these are Syrians and they would take whole families. So the issue of family reunification is not a problem. People would not risk their lives, the human traffickers would not earn money, while those who try to reach Greek islands irregularly would begin to realize that this is no way to reach Europe. They would not be taken to the mainland to walk towards Germany or across the Balkans. In this way, Turkey, Germany, Sweden, Austria and other countries that take part would send two very powerful messages. The border would be controlled, but resettlement, the legal and orderly process of helping refugees and sharing the responsibility for them with Turkey, the European Union would also need to offer something else that Turks have demanded rightly for the last 10 years, which is the liberalization of visa, the visa requirement for Turkish tourists. We are talking here about the visa that Turkish visitors who want to go on a trip no longer than three months to the European Union, the visa requirement that they now have. Now, let's just put it in context that every Balkan country, Bosnia, Albania, Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro, even Moldova, has seen the visa requirement removed in the last few years. So Turkey is, next to Kosovo, the only country in the region that still needs a visa. If Turkey helps the European Union by taking back refugees from Greece, if Turkey offers a perspective to Syrians and implements its new law on asylum by opening the labor market, if Turkey makes this major investment in building up opportunities of educating the next young generation of Syrian refugees so that they have a future, then the European Union should really promise to lift the visa requirement. And I think the best way to signal its seriousness is to start a process which takes six months or five months to put Turkey on the white Schengen list to start this process now. And then to say if by April 1st Turkey has taken back refugees from Greece for three months, the European Union will lift the visa requirement. Now this plan could work. It could work very quickly if it begins to be prepared today. So let me sum it up once more in five simple steps. Germany and a group of EU members accept to take and resettle hundreds of thousands of Syrians from Turkey. They come to Turkey, they make this offer and they say this process can start, let's say 1st of January, 15th of January. It has to start soon. Greece considers Turkey a safe third country because Turkey begins to process asylum claims inside its own country in basis, on the basis of its own law. Once Greece can consider Turkey a safe third country, Turkey commits to take back everybody who reaches Greece after the 1st of January 2016. And at the same time, Turkey, with money that the European Union will also give Turkey for refugee projects, begins to improve dramatically the conditions and prospects of Syrians in the country. And finally, if all this works, the visa requirement for Turkish citizens will be lifted. This plan can work, but it needs to be seriously prepared. Time is pressing. The politics in Europe will make it harder and harder for leaders to begin to offer the kind of solution that will make a difference. If this fails, if Germany one of the richest countries in the world with a population open to accept refugees and with a very popular chancellor. If Germany fails in addressing this issue, if Sweden has to close its doors and give up on its support for international refugee law, 
the future of the Convention for Refugees itself is at risk. But if Germany succeeds, if the European Union succeeds and if Turkey succeeds to find a solution in which major resettlement plays a key role, this will be a signal to the rest of the industrialized world, to Australia and Canada, to America and Japan, to Korea and other parts of the world, that the way to fill the Refugee Convention with life is to help refugees without forcing them to first illegally cross borders. And that would truly be a good day for Turkey, Europe, the Refugee Convention and the future of international law in the world. Focusing on clear and practical solutions. This has not yet happened. And so what I would like to do now is to outline how we best think about the opportunity and danger created by the inflow of mainly Syrian but also other refugees into the European Union in 2015. Let us first understand the nature of the crisis we are dealing with. Syria is today the country that is generating the largest number of refugees in the world. Turkey is today the country that hosts the largest number of refugees in the world. Lebanon is today the country with the largest number of refugees. In South Korea it was 3,000. The rich countries in the world, the industrial countries, have found a way not to be touched and while they maintain their commitment to the Refugee Convention and the right to asylum, they have actually created a situation where very few refugees are in a position to even submit a claim. So the crisis that we see is that today, as a result of the movement of refugees into the European Union, three countries, Germany, Sweden and Austria, are likely to be receiving more than two-thirds of all asylum applications per capita, per population. So we are dealing with a very specific consequence of the four-year war that has been waged in Syria and that shows no sign of ending. We are also dealing with a crisis of the global response. If we look at asylum applications in 2014 around the world, we see that most of the rich countries in the world have found ways to isolate, insulate themselves from refugee movements. Last year the total number of asylum applications in the whole year in Australia was less than 9,000. In Japan it was 5,000. In everybody agrees. The crisis that has been created as a humanitarian crisis of refugees, as a crisis and challenge to the international asylum system, and as a crisis to mainstream politics and mainstream parties in the European Union, linked to the tragic humanitarian emergency in Syria, has become the central issue in European politics. In order to find ways to address this crisis, to turn it into an opportunity that strengthens the international asylum system, and to prevent it eroding the core values of the European Union, we need clear thinking, setting aside illusions and focusing Today, at the end of 2015,